Seoul, Korea is such a city of contrast. You have the old and the new. You have palaces next to gleaming skyscrapers. And at this restaurant, Hanchi Gongan, a chef is taking Korean palace dining, the most rarefied and exclusive of Korean cuisine, and she's modernizing it, putting it into a fine dining setting. But she's not using Western techniques. She's not using French techniques. Instead, she's leaning on tried and true Korean techniques and modernizing Korean palace food. All right, so this is the first dish. It's called pugak. The technique is super interesting. When you have the glutinous rice that's spread on it and, and she doesn't even season it afterwards, right? Because that's sort of a gut reaction. If you're like, when you see something like this, you want to sprinkle salt on it and the glutinous rice is already seasoned. When it gets fried, it just really goes in the deep fryer and it comes right out and it's ready to go. It just almost blooms. These are so addictive. Yeah, this is your first restaurant and you decided to do this sort of palace style cooking. So tell me why you want to do this cuisine. 그것이 음식으로 역사적인 그런 어떻게 자료로만 남아 있는 게 아니라 사람들이 누리던 음식을 이제는 다 평등화된 모든 사람들이 다 같이 누릴 수 있는 음식이라는 생각이 들어서 This is Chef Cho's take on chup. Instead of, you know, rice, it is hazelnut, pine nut, little pieces of shrimp. Even if you were to buy pine nuts today in the supermarket like a little pack like this is quite expensive. It's definitely something very regal and upscale and, and um, expensive and luxurious, even in a bowl of porridge. Oh, the first thing I really taste is just that totally unique pine nut, right? Pine nut is such a strange ingredient and especially you get inside the, the porridge, you're getting nice fresh chunks of shrimp. You know, I look to my right and there is uh, one of the largest palaces in Seoul. You know, just the grandness of it, right? It's so cool to see that juxtaposition. It contextualizes what Chef Cho is doing. That is really incredible. Such an amazing representation of what Korean food can be. It's fish, but it's been cooked just gently. It's been kissed with just enough fire and flame and, and, and heat. But at the same time, it's still kind of, it's still sort of raw. I'm really taken aback, and especially with the sauce, the, the vinegary, lemony, like a hint of the floral persimmon. Abalone can be such a terrible thing if it's not cooked right but um, this just melts in your mouth. Holy crap, this is so good. Stunning. Fresh tofu, it's made from a black bean. When you shell it, it's just wonderful green color, it almost looks like pandan to me. So you have pickled sunchoke and um, mushroom and watercress. It's a little more textured than your standard soybean tofu. It's kissed with this sort of sancho oil. So this is sort of lukewarm, it's cold, it's a nice little interlude. I'm very excited because actually I've never had this dish, even though it's a pretty legendary dish. What Chef Cho has done is made it a little more compact, a little more consistent. What they've done is like cut these elegant little rectangles of various ingredients, like tofu, this is an omelet with mussels chopped into it, this is the cod that she she fried, and um, there's a there's a layer of egg on each side. 
meatballs, walnuts, and then there's this sort of look white mushroom, looks like kind of hen of the woodsy. I think that's where you get this juxtaposition, get the side by side of modern and, and old and traditional. Mmm. This is the Hanu beef bulgogi. It's made with Hanu beef, the most exclusive and the most expensive Korean produced beef. This is like Wagyu, very fatty, very rich, very small production. So that's what I'm having here, and I'm very excited. Wow. It's really hard to make direct comparisons. Hanu beef, Wagyu, or USDA Prime. It's just some damn good beef. The marinades uh, are very complimentary, right? Hey, we're having Korean food. We're having a very exclusive Korean dish, right? Because of the soy, the way that the soy and the honey, the sweetness, the savoriness, and also the char. And interestingly enough, it makes total sense in this sort of royal meal because hundreds of years ago in the Tosun dynasty, you would not be able to eat beef unless you were the king. It was so exclusive and so, um, so expensive. Very juicy. 외국 문화에 더 먼저 접근을 해서 출발을 어, 글로벌한 그런 그 색깔을 가지고 출발하는 경우가 좀 많다고 생각이 드는데 저는 그 젊은 셰프들이 그 우리의 그 고유한 고유한 문화의 그 좋은 점을 더그 깊이 느끼면 좋겠어서 자꾸 우리 거를 가지고 어, 현대에 맞게 변화시키는 노력을 해왔었죠. So this is, this is it. This is the final course you get here. It's called papsan, and it's very royal. It's so elegant. There's little bites here. It's a nice finish to the meal. You know, we're finally getting some rice, and we get some soup. It feels familiar. It feels like something you would get like at a traditional Korean restaurant. That changdorim is amazing. Seaweed soup. Mm. Wow, I love how clean that is. Precise. The essence of seaweed. This is a mustard leaf kimchi. This is a great final chapter of this meal. You know, I think what's wonderful about this meal is that you have the highest level of a certain cooking. And oftentimes, you know, because of the influence of you know, international fine dining, that seems to be the standard. That seems to be the approach and the methodology. But here, the inspiration is Korean palace dining. Thanks so much for watching this episode of K-Town. If you want to see me eating my way through Korea, click right here.